A very good morning to all of you once again. And I welcome you to our teaching program of Department of Urology, SMS Medical College, Jaipur. Today, we have a class on antenatal hydronephrosis. This would be presented by our resident, uh, Dr. Rajesh Kumavat, and would be moderated by our faculty, Dr. R.D. Sahu. So I would request Rajesh to kindly start his presentation. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. And my good morning, my seniors and colleagues. Uh, today, my presentation is on antenatal hydronephrosis and urinary tract dilatation system. And moderator, Dr. Radi Sao, sir. Hydronephrosis is the dilatation of the renal pelvis with or without dilatation of the renal calyces. Currently, the term urinary tract dilatation is proposed under congenital abnormalities of the kidney and the urinary tract. Urinary tract dilatation is the second most common anomaly uh, detected during antenatal screening. Urological incidence 1 to 3% among all urological abnormalities. And uh, antenatal hydronephrosis is most commonly detected in uh, second trimester. Uh, our aim of this topic is um, overview of uh, grading systems, prenatal consultation for specific conditions, role of interventions, and what imaging modalities are used, and differential diagnosis with expected outcomes and risk stratification systems. Now, antenatal hydronephrosis defined as anterior posterior diameter of renal pelvis, uh, if more than uh, more than four mm in second trimester and uh, more than seven mm in third trimester. Causes of pediatric hydronephrosis is uh, categorized into two categories, obstructive cause and non-obstructive cause. Obstructive cause is like PUJO, uh, UVJO, ectopic ureter, ureterocils, posterior urethral wall, anterior urethral wall, urethral atresia, and congenital urethral structure. And in non-obstructive causes is VUR, primary non-obstructive ureter, megacalicosis, fetal faults, and neurogenic bladders. Some conditions making uh, hydronephrosis is uh, extra renal pelvis, multicystic dysplastic kidney, peripelvic cyst, and luminatal kidneys. Now, etiology and incidence of antenatal hydronephrosis. Most common, most common incidence of uh, most common etiology among all uh, cause of antenatal hydronephrosis is transient urinary tract dilatation in 50 to 70 percent cases. And uh, second most common, uh, PUJO and VUR in 10 to 30 to 40 percent. And lower urinary tract obstruction is the least common incidence in antenat cause of antenatal hydronephrosis. Now, grading system of uh, antenatal hydronephrosis is uh, categorized in mild and moderate and severe degree of antenatal hydronephrosis. And based on this grading system, based on anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter. In mild category, uh, in second trimester, uh, renal pelvis diameter, anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter is 4 to 7 mm. And in third trimester, between 7 to 9 mm. In moderate degree of antenatal hydronephrosis is anterior posterior diameter of in second trimester in between 7 to 10 mm. And third trimester in between 9 to 15 mm. In severe degree of uh, antenatal hydronephrosis, when Anterior, anterior posterior in the uh, renal pelvis diameter is more than 10 mm in second trimester and more than 15 mm in third trimester. Now, SFU grading, uh, Society of Fetal Urology grading is a subjective five point grading system that relies on a combination of renal pelvis or calicid dilatation and the integrity of renal par parenchyma. The SFU system has been demonstrated to be predictive of the both renal function and need of surgical intervention in patient with uh, prenatal urinary tract dilatations. Now, different type of uh, uh, SFU grading. SFU grading is a five type. SFU grading zero is normal. In, in SFU grade one is a, 
when renal pelvis is visible but not as as such dilatation in SFU grade one. In SFU grade two, when pelvis and major calyces are dilated and minor calyces not dilated. In SFU grade three, uni there is uniformly dilated as well as minor calyx and major calyx, but parenchyma is spared as compared to SFU grade four. In SFU grade four, there is parenchymal compromise also. Urinary tract dilatation system grading. The grading system, the UTD grading system consists of six point template that combine two of the most common symptom employed. One is uh, anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter, and se second is SFU grading system, including both objective and subjective evaluation. In effort to mitigate postnatal overtesting, the UTD working group established a normal value of postnatal APD anterior posterior diameter, which parallel to those observed for prenatal period. Now, the six, standard six point parameter uh, to be measured by uh, sonography, uh, UTD classification parameter. One is anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter measured by sonography on transverse image. Uh, second is um, calicial dilatations. Third is parenchymal thickness or parenchymal appearance. Fourth is ureteral, any abnormalities in ureters. And for fifth is any uh, Changes in bladder like uh, bladder wall thickness for presence of ureteral seal or dilated posterior urethra. And worst um, six is postnatally uh, unexpected oligohydromes. The normal uh, threshold value for pre and postnatal anterior posterior diameter in ultrasonographic finding, I already uh, told when anterior posterior diameter is less than 4 mm in second trimester is normal and less than 7 mm in third trimester and less than 10 mm in postnatal period. And rest other parameters are normal. Now risk stratification and the management of prenatal urinary tract dilated system. Risk stratification is uh, categorized into two group, uh, low risk group and incre increased risk group. Low risk group of prenatal presentation is when uh, anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter is less than 7 mm in second trimester and in between 7 to 10 mm in third trimester with normal other parameter like uh, um, calicial dilatation and parenchymal thickness, parenchymal appearance, ureter and bladder. All other parameters are normal is categorized into low risk group of prenatal UTD. And increased risk group of ETD is a UTD A2 and A3 when prenatal presentation is anterior posterior diameter of uh, second trimester in second trimester is more than 7 mm and in third trimester is more than 10 mm with all other parameter abnormality like peripheral calcial dilatation with parenchymal thickness abnormality with uh, abnormal ureter finding with abnormal bladder finding and unexpected oligohydromnios also present now risk based management of prenatal prenatal urinary tract dilatation in low risk group uh, management in prenatal period is one additional ultrasonography after 32 weeks and after birth is two additional sonography. One is after 42 hours of birth to one month and second is one month to six months later. In increased risk group, the management of uh, in prenatal period, prenatal period, every um, four to six weeks we do ultrasonography to look out any changes in anterior posterior diameter of renal pelvis and after birth uh, first USG at after 48 hour of birth and one and second USG one month of age. Prenatal management in prenatal management termination of pregnancy is generally not recommended except in some conditions like severe oligohydromios and main factor is major structural abnormalities. Otherwise diagnostic and therapeutic intervention as um, present in a specialized center in mostly lower urinary tract obstruction like uh, finding is like bilateral hydrouterinopsis, dilated ureter and oligohydromnios. Uh, the criteria for identifying candidate for fetal interventions, uh, USG finding is equal use when equal use and renal parenchyma and no other system abnormalities and when um, baby's karyotype is normal and favorable serial urine electrolyte like decreasing sodium level less than 100 milligram per deciliter, decreasing calcium, decreasing hypertonicity, osmolarity of uh, urine is less than 200 milli osmolarity per liter, decreasing beta 2 microglobulin and decreasing protein. 
indication and condition of in utero decompression like when uh, evidence of bladder outlet obstruction like dilated ureter with hydro ureteral nephrosis uh, generally present in male fetus and oligohydromyos present and favorable urinary indices Fetal intervention generally done in mid second trimester, like um, one is vesico amniotic drainage and known as rhodex and risk, uh, risk of um, fetal intervention like um, is fetal loss, echorio, amniotis, time labor, improved perinatal survival in severe obstructions and long term renal outcome and mortality. Uh, this image showing technique of uh, fetal vesico amniotic and placement. In image A, the fetal bladder is initially reached with a needle and the large bone introducing large bone introducing sheath is passed into bladder. In uh, image B and C, is uh, the shunt is uh, double both and open shunt is passed through the sheath. And in image D, uh, in, in image D. The um, both head open pigtail uh, sheath, uh, both both head open shunt is placed uh, one end in between uh, one end is placed in baby's baby's bladder and second is uh, in uterus amniotic cavity. Second intervention is a uh, fetal cystoscopy. Uh, direct visualization of the cause of lower urinary tract obstruction has improved the ability to obtain a fetal diagnosis and afford the opportunity for directed interventions that will allow bladder cycling without the dependence on functional device through pregnancy. In fetal cystoscopy, uh, access, suprapubic access allowed the use of laser to ablate the wall in integrated manner. Image is showing fetal cystoscopy for visualization uh, of the fetal bladder neck. And uh, in image B, cystoscopic view of dilated posterior urethra in posterior urethral wall. A report from uh, Society of Fetal Urology endorses a severity of disease classification system developed by Ruano that was indexed to perinatal and renal outcome. The purpose was an attempt to better identifying patients that may benefit from fetal interventions. Classification system proposed by Ruano for prenatal lower urinary tract obstruction uh, categorized in stage in three stages. Stage one is mild lower urinary tract obstruction. Stage two is severe lower urinary tract obstruction with preserved uh, renal function and stage 3 is also severe lower unit tract obstruction with abnormal renal functions. The parameter of uh, which is uh, defined in Ruano classification, uh, amniotic fluid is generally normal in stage 1 and oligohydroamniotic in stage 2 and generally anhydroamniotic in stage 3. In men, purpose of the classification of Ruano is a fetal intervention. Generally, stage one is not fetal intervention of in stage one is not indicated, and stage two fetal intervention indicated to prevent pulmonary hyperplasia, so pulmonary hypoplasia and severe renal impairment. In stage three, also fetal intervention is uh, needed for to prevent pulmonary hyper, hypoplasia, but not postnatal renal impairment. Prenatal monitoring algorithm, antenatal hydronephrosis already discussed. Now, postnatal evaluation. Imaging is renal ultrasound and mixturating cystoerythrogram, renal scintigraphy, and MR urography. In USG, the uh, advantage of USG is simplest to radiologist and easy to reassure in milder case regarding resolution and extent of evaluation. The disadvantage of USG is it club different etiology of antenatal hydronephrosis and need for intervention is not predicted, has to be decided on each diagnosis severity. Picturating cystoerythrogram is indicated in when unilateral bilateral hydronephrosis of uh, Society of Fetal Urology grade 3 and 4, when anterior posterior diameter is more than 10 mm or ureteric dilatation, and patient with antenatal hydronephrosis would, would develop UTI. In lower unit tract obstruction, MCU is done within 20 to 72 hours after birth and other cases in after 4 to 6 weeks of age. Renal scintigraphy is indicated in moderate to severe unilateral or bilateral hydronephrosis in SFU grade 3 and 4 who do not show VUR. Infant with hydronephrosis with dilated ureter and absent VUR. Patient with VUR and worsening hydronephrosis to look for existing PUJO. 
and the renal scintigraphy for use for assess renal function, renal perfusion, glomerular function of each kidney, structural abnormalities, drainage of the collecting systems, and guide for intervention. When decreased differential count less than 40%, we go for in surgical management. And the drawback of renal scintigraphy is uh, there is no anatomical detail and it done preferably six to eight weeks after birth. To cortical transient time uh, defined as the time taken by the tracer to pass from the cortex to the pelvic calicial system. The need of cortical transition time because the dilated system will necessarily have a slow rate of clearance of radio tracer despite the lack of functional obstruction as the system has to fill before the drainage is appreciable. The aim of uh, aim to review the usefulness of cortical transient time to differentiate obstructive from non-obstructive dilatation of the pelvic calcium system. Uh, the diagram showing renogram, renogram showing image, uh, renogram image showing normal cortical transient time uh, less than three minutes and delayed cortical transition when more than three minutes. In image first, in, in normal cortical transient time uh, and image second is left hydronephrotic kidney showing delayed cortical transition time. Now, MR urography uh, require when there is need of anatomical detail and or, and or renal function to add in operative planning in such case, in cases like the duplex system and retro cable ureter and rare situation like VUJ plus PUJ. So risk stratification for postnatal urinary tract dilatations categorized into, into three groups, UTD P1 low risk group and intermediate risk group and high risk group. Low risk group postnatal presentation uh, when uh, anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter is uh, in between 10 to 15 mm with only major calcial dilatation and other parameter parenchymal thickness, ureter and bladder are normal. And uh, categorize into intermediate risk group when postnatal presentation is uh, anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter is more than 15 mm with peripheral calcial dilatation and abnormalities in ureter and kidney and bladder is normal. And high risk group presentation is when um, anterior posterior diameter of more than 15 centimeter but with peripheral calcial dilatation and parenchymal thickness and ureter and bladder abnormality also present. Now, management uh, of postnatal urinary tract dilatation group. The low risk group uh, managed, low risk group P1 UTD is managed by uh, low risk group for P1 in SFU grading 1 or 2. Uh, there is complete resolution has been demonstrated to occur in most patients between 1 to 2 years of age. It is reasonable to obtain the second postnatal ultrasonography between three to six months of age, and there is no uh, recommending prophylaxis antibiotic and uh, maturating cystourethrogram in low risk group. In intermediate risk group is less defined. The uh, recommendation of prophylaxis antibiotic and maturating cystourethrogram is also left to discretion to the treating physician. And high risk group is more defined, and this group to be most risk for UTL deterioration of the renal functions and need for surgical intervention. The use of prophylaxis antibiotic and lower urinary tract imaging and renal scintigraphy like DTP are also recommended for high risk group of postnatal urinary tract dilatation. Uh, consideration for severe bilateral UTD after delivery, it is important to promptly decompress when the urinary uh, promptly decompress the urinary bladder and start antibiotic prophylaxis immediately and proceed with prompt evaluation of the urinary tract to determine the urinary tract infection incidence is 8 to 20 percent in cases the degree of kidney dilatation is predictive of risk for uti in patient with uh, prenatal urinary tract dilatation uniformity exists in identifying female gender and high grade kidney dilatation uh, high risk postnatal presentation and SQ grade 4 and uncircumcised status of male as factor uh, are associated with increased risk of UTI. Profiling, prophylactic antibiotic is not clearly defined and currently recommendation restrict the use of prophylactic antibiotic to those at in use only in increased risk of UTI and generally used in third generation cephalosporin, amoxicillin and nitrofurantoin is used only after 8 weeks of birth. Now, algorithm of the postnatal management. Postnatal ultrasound generally done after uh, 48 weeks of life. If no hydronephrosis or SFU grade 
zero or anterior posterior diameter is less than seven mm, there is no intervention. If mild hydronephrosis without ureteric dilatation, SFU grade one and two, uh, then manage ultrasound after three to six uh, three to six months of life until or until resolution. When moderate and severe hydronephrosis or SFU grade three and four and postnatal anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter is more than ten mm or with mild hydronephrosis with ureteric dilatation, then go for micturating cystourethrogram. In and in micturating cystourethrogram is uh, reflex is present, then give antibiotic prophylaxis. If no viewer, then go for uh, renal scintigraphy or diuretic renography DTPA scan. If uh, not um, obstructive pattern, then go for surgery. If differential function is less than 40% or decline on follow-up. If non-obstructive pattern, then conservatively manage and uh, done ultrasound after three to six months of life. And in MCU, if lower urinary tract obstruction, then immediate go for surgery. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the good presentation. Uh, so today's topic is a uh, uh, important in the sense that it's a, a theoretical question for examination for the residents. And uh, uh, it's also important because many of the times uh, after passing out, you will get references from gynecologist or pediatrician uh, of cases of antenatal and postnatal hydronephrosis and how to deal with them. So before we uh, take the classes, uh, it's a real pleasure for us to have two stalwarts with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Chandra Singh, who is the uh, head of the department at CMC Vellore, uh, who is a pediatric neurologist also has joined us. Thank you, Dr. Chandra Singh, uh, for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Such a very short notice. And I'm really uh, pleased to know that your uh, connection is uh, okay. The next yeah, connection is really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we have Dr. Bhatt also with us, Dr. Amilal Bhatt. Dr. Bhatt, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we all know Dr. Bhatt. Uh, he is, again, a very well-known uh, pediatric urologist. Uh, so, Dr. Chandra, I will just, uh, because you are in busy in the OPD, so uh, this, case, uh, this uh, class was on antenatal hydronephrosis and uh, how to uh, deal with these patients, how to grade them, uh, and uh, how to manage them. And so uh, I would request your comments uh, before you become busy in the OPD. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shivam. The thing is, the algorithm was very nicely presented by the presenter. Uh, my couple of uh, points that I would like to add are when it comes to dealing with the families, we get two extreme ends of the spectrum, which we have to be careful about. One is a group which thinks just because there is some hydronephrosis, this child is going into kidney failure and they even start crying, mothers telling whether they can give their kidney to their child. So that particular group needs reassurance that it's not that horrible, but it needs regular follow-up. Then the other end of the spectrum are those who have bilateral hydronephrosis, but who we feel may not be amenable to follow-up. So in that group, the importance of being on follow-up in the absence of which they may lose their kidneys needs to be emphasized. So that is where the clinician's role comes. The second point is their understanding of this whole renogram. Because when we say 50-50, one group assumes both kidneys are functioning only 50%. So that we need to clarify that even in somebody who has 100, you know, the sum of both will be 100. So if this is 90, automatically the other one will be 10. So the total can never be 100 plus 100. It only be 50 plus 50. And also to tell them that the calculation based on these images are a little less accurate compared to what we see on the image, progressively worsening hydronephrosis, thinning of parenchyma. They all get picked up much earlier than the scan showing a drop in function. So they can't assume that just because the scan is not showing any drop in function, the kidney is not worsening. So that is the second point I want to highlight. Third is when it comes to this uh, antimicrobial prophylaxis. We don't encounter too many children who have had upper tract dilatation alone without ureteric dilatation developing UTI. So probably there is a lesser and lesser role of any antimicrobial prophylaxis, especially because we encounter so much of uh, resistance. 
So if there are any other questions, I'll be happy to address that. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandhya Singh. Uh, yes, uh, the points are very well taken. Uh, we know uh, uh, amongst this antenatal hydronephrosis, about uh, two thirds of these patients are belong to transient hydronephrosis process which resolved within 24 reassurance uh, to uh, the parents of the children uh, would be the best thing to do in these patients and uh, definitely we have on the other spectrum the severe utd or p3 variety of utd where they require aggressive kind of a management if we want to uh, save their kidneys so uh, and then the role of antibiotic prophylaxis as you said is again controversial and uh, Particularly, the high risk group definitely would require uh, the antibiotic prophylaxis, and not everyone. So, uh, in the meantime, I would request Dr. Bhatt uh, to please uh, give his brief comments, and then we will uh, continue with the queries. In the meantime, if a residents um, and uh, faculty have any question, uh, we have the opportunity sure. today to have two stalwarts <laughs> with us of pediatric urology of our country uh, to be ready with your queries. Yes, Dr. Bhatt, please go ahead. Dr. Bhatt, you're, you're, you are muted, sir. Uh, your sound is not there. Uh, thank you, yes. Professor Shivam. Yeah, yes. I must compliment. Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, it's, it's a little unstable. Unstable, now it's okay. Uh, are you getting my sound? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it was a very... Uh, uh, brief overview of the antenatal as well as the postnatal. The, the thing which I want to convey to the residents is that uh, the conservative approach in postnatal and selected interventional approach, both antenatal as well as postnatal. The indications which were discussed in anti, uh, antenatal were only where we are thinking that you have to prevent the pulmonary hypoplasia and drain the bladder. Second one is that they, whenever you suspect that bilateral hydronephrosis, that is intra, uh, intrauterine intervention is only in the bilateral hydronephrosis, not in, in uh, unilateral hydronephrosis. And that too, that may be both one, periurethral as well as a vesicoamniotic shunt. Second one is that endoscopic as well as few centers, they do open up the, they do the, the hysterotomy and then put the scent and then do it back. But keeping this mind and explaining the patient in detail that this has to be done in only in the, the higher center where mm -hmm. they are doing it and there is a high risk of the fetal as well as the mother problems. Another one. Second one is a postnatal, what we have said that unilateral hydronephrosis, usually the patients, as uh, Dr. Chandra told, the patients are panicky about the intervention. Go ahead, go ahead. If that unilateral hydronephrosis, wait and watch. Six weeks, four to six weeks, you are getting renogram. And if renogram function, another renogram at three months, if that shows that there is a deterioration of the function, then go ahead. Otherwise, wait for the unilateral hydronephrosis for surgery. These are my comments. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt, for your uh, comments. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, if the resident has any query, uh, we have uh, with us two experts and they can give uh, the comments. Yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Sahaj, please go ahead. Sir, how to take sample for fetal urinary by this uh, That is by amniocentesis. Okay, an indication of antenatal hydronephrosis uh, management. It was given that male fetus and singleton fetus. Why male fetus is only preferred for antenatal intervention? And if it is a female intervention, then we don't uh, female fetus, then we don't have to go for any intervention. Okay, okay. So the question was uh, uh, from our resident that. Uh, uh, how do you uh, e exactly examine the fetal uh, abnormalities? Uh, so I told them that there's an amniotic sentences. You have to take the fluid and then examine the, the uh, various parameters. Second question was why only in male fetus uh, this intervention is done. So my take is that because in male uh, uh, fetus, the chance of the lower unit tract obstruction is highest. The posterior valve, which is the commonest cause, uh, which requires 
the psychoamniotic shunt or uh, pedal cystoscopy uh, is in male fetus only. So a female fetus usually would not have that kind of lower unit tract obstruction. Uh, any comment from Dr. Chandra, please? Yeah, so in female fetuses, uh, there may be other causes like uh, bilateral obstructive megaureters, but there, this kind of intervention is not likely to be of any use. They don't have the kind of urethral atresy or post-urethral valve, which, as uh, Professor Shiva mentioned, are a problems in females. So, but the other problems which can present like this, as I mentioned before, bilateral obstructive mega ureters, rare but possible. But there, these interventions are not of use because the obstruction is above the level of uh, where we are intervening. Yes. So, so uh, is there any role of doing a percutaneous nephrostomy uh, in uh, these patients who have severe bilateral hydronephrosis? If there's the both the kidneys are abnormal uh, as a fetal intervention. As a fetal intervention, it's just yeah. that such even for those with obstructed uh, lower urinary tract obstruction, the group where the renal function is still preserved. And just for them to tide over the pulmonary hypoplasia and them to have a normal birth, the group is a very small subselected group. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Over and above that, with a percutaneous uh, nephrostomy or a uh, supravesical diversion, the chance of that closing up is very high and chance of infection is very high. So the potential right. benefit, if, an, if at all, is very, very minimal. Right, right. So, so we have to balance the risk uh, which are there for any fetal intervention, the chance of chorioamnionitis infection and losing the fetus and all that, uh, or having a preterm labor. All these risks are there. So we have to balance it and then try to see whether this intervention is required or not. Right, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have a few MCQs for our residents also. So before I go for the MCQs, uh, I will just briefly summarize uh, for the benefit of our residents and those who are probably watching us today on Zoom or YouTube. So we are uh, taking a class on antenatal hydronephrosis, which is an important topic. Uh, around 0.6 to around 3 to 4% of uh, children or, or babies uh, can have antenatal hydronephrosis. Uh, the cause could be a transient hydronephrosis, uh, which usually resolves within uh, one to two years or even three years. And uh, the uh, incidence is around two thirds of these patients would actually be transient hydronephrosis. The other group, which uh, is the objective of uh, these patients to be identified are the cacute abnormalities, that is the congenital abnormality of the kidney and uh, ureter and bladder and uh, the urinary tract. So uh, in these patients, we have uh, pelvic ureteric junction obstruction, vesicoureteric reflux, mega ureter, ectopic ureter, ureterocele, posterior thil valve, and all various lower urinary tract obstructions also. So, and the third abnormality is to identify various syndromic manifestations like Down syndrome and various other syndromes, which could be also part of this antenatal hydronephrosis. So, uh, there are various grades uh, for antenatal hydronephrosis. We have discussed one, the commonest is the RPD, that is a renal pelvic diameter. And any patient on first trimester, if more than 4 mm, and second trimester, more than 7 mm, should be evaluated. And uh, the other grading system is the SFU, the School of Fetal uh, Urology, which uh, uh, divides it into four grades. So one, two, three are usually, and it depends upon the uh, parenchymal, uh, the caliceal and pelvic dilatation and the parenchymal uh, thinness of uh, these patients. So the grade four will have thinning of parenchyma along with the dilatation. And the third most important is the UTD, that the urinary tract dilatation, which takes care of the ureter and the bladder abnormalities also. 
So the UTD grading would depend upon not only renal pelvic dilatation, but caliceal dilatation, but renal parenchymal thickness, renal parenchymal ecogenicity, and also the ureter abnormalities and bladder abnormalities. So uh, UTD, again, can be divided into either a prenatal and postnatal, and they can be risk stratified. So there is a prenatal risk stratification, which divides into low and high risk cases. The low risk case is usually defined as A1, uh, UTD, and the high risk is A23 uh, uh, UTD. So low risk group usually will have a only uh, pelvic dilatation, whereas the high risk group will have uh, renal abnormalities also along with it. And then the postnatal uh, UTD classification is again divided into that there is a risk stratification into low, intermediate, and high risk group. So the low risk group is usually where there is only hydronephrosis. The intermediate risk is when there is pelvic initial dilatation also with thinning of the parenchyma. But the high risk group will have, uh, along with this, uh, urate bladder abnormalities and uh, renal ecogenicity, which also is increased. So uh, this is how uh, the stratification has to be done and the management has to be done accordingly. We know in the management, in antenatal management, uh, there are selected patients which can uh, be fit for doing an antenatal intervention. Uh, it's though very low risk, would not uh, require any fetal intervention. Very high risk, usually would not uh, benefit because the renal abnormality, they have renal dysplasia and et cetera, they would not benefit by only patients which will the benefit is the intermediate risk for those patients who have oligohydramnias. And to improve the pulmonary hypoplasia, we can uh, do some kind of uh, this fetal intervention in the form of a psychoamniotic shunt or a fetal cystoscopy where a one to two millimeter endoscope is passed through the anti-abdominal wall into the uterine wall into the bladder and then through the posterior urethra by doing an anti-grade fulguration of the posterior third valve with the help of laser. So that is how they do the fetal intervention. So in postnatal period, as I said, the risk stratification is low, intermediate, and high risk. And the low intermediate, low risk group usually would not require any management. They are monitored and most of them would resolve by themselves. Uh, it is only the high risk group which uh, requires an aggressive uh, intervention and would re may require an antibiotic prophylaxis also. And the intermediate risk would depend upon the clinician's uh, decision whether to intervene or not to intervene. So that was in brief uh, about the uh, summary of the antenatal hydronephrosis. Now we would just go into the, uh, the same presentation, right? into some of the MCQs. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so this is for all uh, residents. So we have made few MCQs. This is uh, the question number one. A newborn girl has prenatally detected left A1 UTD with 8 millimeter anteroposterior diameter APD on third trimester ultrasound. A renal ultrasound is obtained on day of life three, which demonstrates left P1 uh, UTD. What is the most likely cause of this condition? So, transient dilation. So, so this is a, a case of a low risk. Uh, UTD, uh, P1, uh, postnatal UTD. So uh, the most uh, probably explanation is a transient dilatation and uh, majority, about 41 to 88 percent belong to this group. And uh, the normal values are uh, usually less than seven millimeter at uh, third trimester and less than 10 mm at uh, probably postnatal period. So uh, UPG obstruction is the second most cause of UTD. VUR accounts for 10% to 20% and other causes account for less than 10%. So a postnatal ultrasound after 48 hours of age is recommended. So it is very important to understand here that if you do it immediately after the birth, 
the diameter may not be actually because the renal function is not there proper. So uh, we should do a uh, ultrasound at third or fourth week or about four to six weeks uh, after uh, birth, which will give the true picture of the anti and uh, postnatal hydronephrosis. So it is uh, important to do an ultrasound at four to six weeks. So the second question is a circumcised newborn baby a uh, boy with prenatally detected A23 UTD receives a renal ultrasound on DOL3 that is normal. What is the best next step? Right. So this is a newborn boy who has a prenatally detected uh, uh, a high risk of UTD. Oh, but on the uh, ultrasound, there uh, for third day, it is a normal ultrasound. So we should repeat the ultrasound. So I think that is that should be the answer, right? So repeat ultrasound in three to six months or rather even four to six weeks uh, to find out if the ultrasound is normal. So repeat ultrasound in three to six months. If the first postnatal ultrasound demonstrates no dilatation after 48 hours of age, uh, ultrasound should be repeated. Uh, to confirm whether this UTD has resolved. Up to 28% of UTD may be detected after initial negative ultrasounds. Very important to understand this. These, the first initial ultrasound may be normal and about 28% may be abnormal when you do it again after a month or so. An informed discussion should be performed with the family to discuss the therapeutic options. And VCUG should not be performed as the risk of UTI from reflux is currently low in absence of dilatation in a circumcised boy. Similarly, prophylactic antibiotics and renal scintigraphy are not warranted given the low risk of infection. So the, the third, third question is, uh, just yeah. So which of the following is accurate with regard to prenatal intervention of our lower urinary tract obstruction? So improved survival, unchanged long-term renal function, decreased survival, improved long-term renal function, unchanged survival, improved long-term renal function, improved survival, decreased long-term renal function, and decreased survival, unchanged long-term renal function. So what do you expect uh, the, the prenatal intervention to do in patients with lower urinary tract obstruction? So they change the survival, but they do not change the renal function. So which one is that? A. So the improved survival, but there is unchanged long-term renal function. I think that should be the answer. Yes. yes. So... Several publications have shown that prenatal intervention for low unit tract obstruction improves survival without a significant effect on renal function. Prenatal intervention for low unit tract obstruction is most beneficial for those patients who present with oligohydramnios early in the second trimester to facilitate pulmonary development after 27 weeks of gestation. So we uh, have understood the high risk antenatal group where there is oligohydramnios, the fetal uh, serum parameters are showing uh, worse, uh, worsening. There only probably is the indication of fetal intervention. But remember, it is to be done in very, very selected uh, centers. We have to uh, explain the patient attendants and the parents that there is a risk of developing infection, uh, fetal death, or even a preterm labor. Question number four, a six week old circumcised boy is referred to your office for A1 prenatal UTD, right? A1, so it is a low risk uh, prenatal. His postnatal ultrasound at DOL2 demonstrated central caliceal dilatation with an APD of 11 millimeter, right? Again, it is a P1, so again, low risk, 10 to 15 millimeter. The ureter and bladder appears normal and ultrasound repeated today, that is at six weeks, is unchanged. So he is otherwise healthy. What is his most likely outcome? Right? So he is a low risk P1 UTD. So we have discussed this, that the low risk P1 UTD has a very good chance of resolution. 
right? So most of these patients will resolve within 48 to uh, uh, 60 months. So uh, the answer should be his UTD is most likely to resolve within the next 2.5 years. Let's see. Yes. So most patients with this will resolve within 30 months of birth. And this patient has P1 UTD and should be observed with serial ultrasound alone. Guidelines suggest that VCUG should be performed at the discretion of the clinician, but should not universally be applied. UPG obstruction is unlikely with low risk upper tract dilatation. So prophylactic antibiotics and additional imaging study as VCUG and MAC3 scan should be reserved for those patients who are at the highest risk of infection, which includes females, uncircumcised males, high-grade dilatation, and ureteral dilatation. Question five, which of the following is correct with regard to VUR and UTD? All patients who present with PT, P2 UTD should undergo VCUG. P2 is the intermediate risk, right? So UTD correlates in a linear fashion with VUR. All patients with VUR will demonstrate UTD to some degrees on postnatal ultrasound. VUR will occur more commonly in females. VCUG recommended in patients with increased risk of UTI. Pardon? E. e. VCUG is recommended in patients with increased risk of UTI. Right. So our presenter also agrees with it. Yes, so VCUG is recommended in patients with increased risk of UTI. Uh, VCUG is recommended for any patient with P3 UTD or high risk group. P2 and P3 risk categories both include an APD diameter which is greater than or equal to 15 millimeter uh, with uh, peripheral collisional dilatation or ureteral abnormalities. P2 patient may undergo VCUG at discretion of the clinician. P3 or high risk is distinguished by any abnormality of renal parenchymal thickness, renal parenchymal appearance, or abnormality of the bladder. Therefore, a patient with P3 UTD or a high risk should undergo a follow-up at one month and a VCUG and should be started on prophylactic antibiotics. So the choice D should also be the correct one, no? This is Question 5. Let me just go back. Uh, okay. Uh, VUR will occur more commonly in females. No, not necessarily. If there is a urinary tract dilatation and a reflux, the chances are that it would be more common in females. Overall, no. the incidence of reflux is more common in females. Um, UTI is more common. I don't think VUR is more common in females. Uh, we will take this question to the expert, right? So uh, uh, we, just after the completion, we'll take this question. So which of the following is true regarding the link between UTD and UTI? Which of the following is true regarding the link between UTD and UTI? There is no correlation between the degree of dilatation and risk of UTI. Gender doesn't impact risk of UTI. Recent data failed to demonstrate the efficacy of prophylactic antibiotics to prevent UTI in patients with UTD. All patients with UTD should be started on prophylactic antibiotics at birth. The event rate of UTI in patients with UTD is high. C. C. So recent data failed to demonstrate the efficacy of prophylactic antibiotics to prevent UTI in patients with UTD. So all patients of UTD would not require prophylaxis antibiotics. Only the high risk group would require. So uh, say putting these patients, all these patients on prophylactic antibiotics is not a very good recommendation. So I think this is the answer. Yes, so recent data failed to demonstrate the efficacy of prophylactic antibiotics. A recent meta-analysis of 11 studies failed to show a benefit of continuous prophylactic antibiotics on preventing UTI. The degree of UTD is predictive of risk of UTI. Risk factors for UTI include female gender, uncircumcised status, higher grades of UTD, and uh, the imaging is only recommended only for those at higher risk. The incidence of UTI is low, which makes it difficult to study the UTI rates in UTD population. The last question is, an uncircumcised newborn boy with UTD A2, A3, that is a prenatal high-risk group, presents to your clinic at four weeks of age. 
he is on amoxicillin and has not experienced any UTIs. He has been otherwise healthy. A repeat ultrasound today demonstrates peripheral calicial dilatation. APD 20 millimeter, 10 millimeter dilatation of the distal right ureter and a normal bladder. VCUG is negative for reflux. What is the next best step? So an uncircumcised newborn baby with a prenatal high-risk UTD, now presenting postnatally at four weeks of age where there's an APD 20 millimeter. That means it's a P3, postnatal high-risk uh, no, not high risk. It's an intermediate risk because the bladder is normal and uh, probably he doesn't have the ecogenicity also of the kidneys. So it is an intermediate risk. A, 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 so intermediate risk are not necessarily... In, uh, no, no. Why to tra transition to trimethoprim? Usually trimethoprim will not be given in children who are uh, below two and a half months, three months. In the first trimester, you should not give trimethoprim sulfethoxy. So that should not be there. Uh, the should be probably a newborn circumcision. Circumcision can help in preventing urinary tract infection. So let's see. Recommended newborn circumcision. Uncircumcised status and urinary dilatation are risk factors for UTI in this male patient with P2 intermediate risk UTD. An informed discussion should be held with the family to discuss the risk of UTI, risk of circumcision, and continued prophylaxis. The patient is too young to be transitioned to the bactrim, which should not be administered prior to two, three months of age. Similarly, prophylactic antibiotics should not be discontinued in this patient. Renal scintigraphy may be performed at the clinician's discretion, but recommendation for circumcision should not be delayed. So that was, I think, uh, uh, the end. So we would... If Dr. Chandra is there with us, Dr. Chandra, are you there with us or Dr. Bhatt, both of you? Yeah, only the yes. last so, child. I just so, wanted to make him. Pardon, pardon. Yes. The last so uh, there was a question from the uh, our one of our faculty that uh, is vasicouteric reflux more common in female than male? So one of the MCQs. Um, uh, actually, the, yeah. age of presentation. Yeah. In less than one year, male is more common, but beyond one year, female is more common. Right. At right. the time of presentation. Yeah. So is is, is is it true for UTI also? Or only yes. for it's true for UTI. Is it true for UTI presentation? At the time of presentation, those who present less than one year, yes. male is more common, but beyond one year, it is you know if uh, female is one uh, female is more common. So in uh, more the, beyond one uh, more than one year, if the patient is presenting with UTI, with UTI the, the chances of view are common in common, common. More common, yeah. Common in females after one year, so one year, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, that was uh, probably the, we are coming to the end of the class. So for the last uh, brief comments, uh, Doctor Chandra, please. Yeah. Thank you. Topic. So this last child that you mentioned, Doctor Shivam. Because the ureter is dilated and the peripheral calices are dilated, I would be comfortable to do off a renogram at this point because one month is not too, too early. But if it is a significant VUG obstruction, we would uh, intervene a little earlier because both were mentioned, peripheral calcial dilatation as well as the lower ureters being seen. So that right. would be one slight different approach I might follow. Right. So the explanation also told that uh, renal scintigraphy may be done in by uh, many of the yeah, experts yeah. because this is an intermediate risk uh, group, uh, UTD P2. So uh, renal scan definitely is an uh, indication at this age. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Thank Bhatt, you. Uh, do you have it? Yes, please. Dr. Bhatt, yes. you have any last comments? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll get it. Thing important which is that when we are interpreting the renogram, so the postnatally the child's bladder should be empty. Second one is that now recent data has come upon the renal transit time. Renal transit time is more accurate than assessing the renal functions with the, these uh, children of uh, uh, six to eight weeks or about three months. So that has has to be the uh, feed for the youngsters that they should go ahead with that uh, prepare this one 
also. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, uh, our presenter had made that comment on cortical transit time. Yes, patients who have a, a kind of a moderate to severe hydronephrosis, uh, it is better to have that cortical transit time if it is uh, because uh, if it is less than three minutes, it's an early transit time. If it's more than three minutes, it's a delayed transit time. And that can actually give you uh, an indication that whether uh, this uh, patient is having uh, obstructive uh, flow or not. Uh, yes. So, uh, yes, Dr. Chandrasen, uh, you want to make any comment? No, nothing uh, else. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Dr. Chandra, Dr. Bhatt, for joining us today in our class. And I thank all my residents and faculty members and all those who have might joined us today on Zoom and YouTube. Uh, so I would request now our moderator, Dr. R.D. Sahu, to give his last uh, remarks and uh, please wind up the session. Thank you, Matsar and Chandra, sir, for enlightening us by their experience. But thank you, Mr. sir, and thank you, residents and all faculties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and have a good day.